Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 29 this evening. 1 Chronicles chapter number 29. And I'm not really going to preach probably tonight. I'm going to just kind of, uh, I just want to kind of talk to you. And I uh, want to talk to you in lieu of where we're at as a church and, and uh, this, uh, the fact uh, you know, I believe in my heart that Brother Haley Jr. is supposed to be our next pastor. Amen? I believe that in my heart. I, I just don't have any question about that at all. And uh, I just, I'm at peace about it. And uh, I believe Brother Haley Jr. is at peace about it. And uh, I just believe that the Lord's going to open that door. And if he doesn't and he shuts it, then that's okay. I'll just, I'll just uh, bring glory to him. But I won't be here. Uh, when you finally make that uh, vote. Uh, and so I've already told the men on the pulpit committee what my vote would be, though I don't get to vote because I won't be here. But they already know what my vote would be. And uh, I won't be here. I won't be here possibly uh, if we call him when he comes to start pastoring. And I, I might not be here for a month or more when he comes to pastor. And not that I'm anybody special, but uh, I pastored for 26 years. I've been in the ministry for 32 years, so I'm not a novice. I've been in church nine months before I was born, amen? And so I'm 60 years of age, so I've been in church 60 years. I'll be 61 in July, so you can figure that up, plus nine months. That's how many times I've been in church, how long I've been in church. And, uh, and so... I have a great concern for the church. Amen? You know, Ephesians chapter 5, it tells us that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians chapter 5 is a passage about marriage, but if you read it, Paul says, I speak concerning Christ and the church. So when Paul is teaching there in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, wait a minute, this is not really about marriage, it's about the church. Here's what I believe he's teaching there. He says, uh, he says, uh, the church, Christ and his bride, the church pictures what a marriage should be, but a marriage pictures what a church should be. Amen? A church should be like a marriage. You know, you should feel married to this church. Can I tell you, as a pastor, I felt married to the church I was pastoring, which is why I used to say to pastors, to go look for another church while you're still pastoring a church is like a husband looking for another wife when he already has a wife. I don't believe in that stuff. Brother Haley doesn't have a church. He's a, a youth pastor with a call to pastor. I don't believe in that stuff. I don't believe that. I believe that as a pastor, my job is to be totally sold out and committed to my people. Amen. Unless God departs us, I'm not departing from it. Amen. Amen. And I believe as a church member, the same thing is true. I believe that a church member ought to be committed to their church now to be committed to their pastor and uh and so i just want to kind of help you tonight and in first corinthians chapter 29 and uh and let me not get ahead of myself let's just read the passage of scripture i sometimes get to talking and don't get to the scripture amen first chronicles 29 look at me at verse 1 furthermore david the king said unto all the congregation solomon solomon my son whom alone god hath chosen is yet young and tender and the work is great, for the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. I want you to notice that verse there and understand that here's the situation. David, the man of God, has now reached a, uh, his age of death, and he's going to die. And God has instructed him and led him to, to determine that the man who's supposed to follow him is his son, Solomon. And, uh, and now he says to the congregation, all the congregation... Amen. And I'm saying to the congregation, and he said, Solomon, my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. And I want to just kind of speak tonight on this subject. The work is great, the leader yet young and tender. The leader yet young and tender. This is a perfect passage of Scripture for what we have here. Uh, I, if you read and you study, I did some studying to figure out how, how old Solomon was when he took the kingdom. The Jews' tradition is that Solomon was 12 years of age when he became king. 
I don't really believe that, but that's their tradition. That's what they teach. Some scholars say he was 14. But you do a little bit of studying. He had, a, you can study do it, uh, looking at Amnon and Azariah and brothers and kinds of things and David. You can do a little studying. And you'll find that when Solomon took the throne, he was somewhere between the age of 20, no, no, no older than 30. So Solomon became a king in his 20s. Amen. Brother Haley is 24 years of age, amen? And with a lot of people, youth is a, is a question. Youth is something that we worry about. And David knew that his son was young, and he wanted his son and the congregation or the people of Israel to be successful. He wanted them to fulfill God's will. And so he says, my son is, is yet young and tender, and the work of the Lord is great. And so... Uh, and, and, and then he, he talks about all the silver and the gold that he had prepared and dropped down in verse number 5 with me. And he said, and the gold for the things of gold and the silver for things of silver and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of artificers. Now watch this statement. And who then is willing to consecrate his, his service this day unto the Lord? He says, now look, my son is young and tender. And I have done all this to prepare so that he could be successful. But now I'm asking the congregation, who then will consecrate himself to the service of the Lord? And you know what? Look, uh, uh, Brother Haley is, is young. And uh, the word tender there kind of means inexperienced. And he is inexperienced in being a pastor. But you know what? His daddy has prepared. His Bible college teachers have prepared. I don't know. I didn't get to hear him preach, but Sunday, but I found there a lot of maturity in a 24-year-old man. I found some maturity there. I found some Bible knowledge. I found somebody that's willing to seek wisdom. You'll find out that Solomon understood that he was a child. When God said, ask whatever you want, Solomon said, I, I am but a child, a young child, and I do not know how to lead these people. I ask that you give me wisdom amen and i heard brother haley saying i i need wisdom and i will seek wisdom amen but then the the question comes now to the congregation all right here's my son by the way david said some things to solomon if you'll take time to read i don't have time to read it but he said to solomon he said now god gave me this pattern for the temple now it's your job to get it done god has chosen you to do it he says now be strong and courageous and do it amen and David gave counsel to his son and said, now get the job done. I don't care how old you are. I don't care you're a young man. I don't care you're just a youth. I don't care that you're tender. I'm telling you, get the job done. Amen? He spoke to them. But then he spoke to the congregation. And he says, wait a minute. Now understand something. My son is going to need your help. My son is going to need you to get in the yoke with him and help him. And he asked the question there in verse 5, who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord. Who then is willing? Can I tell you something? We never have to do anything against our will. I can will tonight not to be in church, but I will tonight to be in church. I can will never to read my Bible. I can will never to give a tithe and an offering. By the way, I do have a tithe and offering. I need to put in the offering plate before I forget it. Uh, I, 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 I have a will. I can do whatever I and I am, I thank God that I am willing to serve the Lord. Amen. I thank God that I am willing to consecrate myself to his work. I really believe that what is needed more than anything in our churches today is people who will consecrate themselves to the service of the Lord. Consecrate. What does that word consecrate there mean? That word consecrate there means, let me see if I can find it. The word consecrate, I've got it here. Consecrate means to dedicate and devote oneself. And you know, we, I, I hope and I believe this group of people here, we are consecrated to the work of the Lord here at Amazing Grace Baptist Churches. We are dedicated. We are, uh, we are uh, devoted to this work. Amen. First and foremost, we as members of Amazing Grace Baptist Church must, be, must dedicate and devote ourselves to serve the Lord in this local church. Christ died for the church. I know that today church is not popular. I know today a church is, is being changed. Churches become some kind of wacky, weirdo stuff that, uh, that is nothing in the Bible. But you know what? Christ died for the church. Amen. We're living in the church age. Amen. And we need to be devoted and dedicated to our church. Amen. We don't put the church above Christ, but the church is about Christ. Amen. 
And God, Christ chose to do his work through the church. How do you know? He established it. He said he gave some apostles, evangelists, preachers, teachers for the perfecting of the saint for the work of the ministry. Amen? And then he says that every person in the body has been given a job to do, made the eye or the ear or the hand for the edifying of the body of Christ. Amen? And for the, for, the, for, the, for the church to grow by that which every joint supplieth, maketh increase of itself. And God wants churches all over America that are thriving and showing the world Jesus Christ and showing the world what, 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 what Christianity involves, which is a devotion and a consecration to be in church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. For the world doesn't see life that way, and they think you and I are weird because we do that, and that shows them a commitment and a devotion, amen? The world has got one hour maybe for God a week. Amen. And by the way, Sunday morning we can't get out of bed because we did too much partying Saturday night, so we want to have our service Saturday night before we go partying. Partying. Amen. There's no commitment, little commitment. Now listen, uh, Solomon here has said to his son, he said, uh, he said, my son is young and tender. I call for a consecration. I call for you to consecrate yourself to the sanctuary, the service, and to the servant. He says, I want you to be involved in the church. I want you to be involved in the, in the services, and I, in the service, and I want you to be involved or consecrated to my son. He says, look, here's my boy. And my boy's going to have to do all this. It's a great work. It is a huge work. Can I say to you this? Listen, pastoring a church is a, is a huge thing. If you never pastored a church, you have no clue. You have no clue of the responsibility and the accountability there is. Amen? I mean, this young man is getting ready to step in and take over God's ordained institution whereby people get saved, baptized, and trained, whereby God's people get loved and where God's people learn, where God's people get led. And I tell you what, the Bible says that you don't even want to be called a master. You don't want to be a master because there's a greater condemnation for those who find themselves in the place of leadership. And this young man is taking on himself a huge responsibility and burden. Uh, being just the ministry itself, just the pastor itself. But then you put on top of that the situations that we have as a church with, uh, with, with, with the need for uh, growth and attendance, uh, with the financial needs. This young man is carrying a huge burden on his shoulder. And God has given him that and called him, I believe that, and chosen him just like Solomon. And I believe that that young man will hear the instructions to be of good courage and strengthen himself and do the job. But then our job, as David is saying, is you need to get in the yoke and you need to help my son so he and so that he does not fail and he is a success. I, Dr. Lee Robertson said, uh, everything rises and falls on leadership. And I believe in leadership. And I believe that there, there it's truth. If leadership does not do what it's supposed to do, the church will not prosper. If it does not, if it does not do what it's supposed to the church will fall. But I also know this after pastoring for 26 years, that, that things also depend on fellowship. Fellowship. Moses was a great leader, but the children of Israel were stiff-necked and rebellious and didn't want to follow. And every time God told Moses to do something, they bellyache and complained, and they pulled back, and they said, we don't want to do that, and they went the opposite direction. And, 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 and that wasn't Moses' fault. Moses' fault was when he lost his temper. But up until then, Moses didn't make a mistake. And so it wasn't the leadership problem, it was the fellowship problem. So there's two things to this principle, and David dealt with both of them. There's the leader, there's the man of God who is chosen and called to do the work. And then there's the congregation. And we need to be consecrated to the service of the Lord. I want to ask you are, you, are you deeply dedicated to this thing? Are you deeply devoted to this thing? I mean, are you willing to get in and sacrifice and serve? Amen. Because that's what's going to take. Amen. You know, truth of the matter is, we let Pastor Holman do a lot of the work that we should have been doing. Somebody can say amen right there. Show the lack of dedication, consecration. I'm not as dedicated and devoted. You know, 
I, 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 I just come here so I can just, uh, I, I want to fulfill my responsibilities and I want to get, but I want to give. And I'm not trying to be mean. I think one of the good things that happened with Pastor Home and God is we've learned that we have to get involved and get, give, amen, give, 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 and do, amen. But now we got a pastor, it's not time for us to say, well, now, good, pastor can take care of this. Pastor can handle this now. I've been handling this so long, now pastor can take care of it. Nope. We all, still need, we all still need to be consecrated to the service of the Lord. The work is great, and the leader yet young and tender. Now, how do we treat and help the leader? Well, let me give you some words tonight. Number one, write down the word love. 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 Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12. How do we help? How do we treat and how do we help the leader, even though he's young? Even though, even though he, you know, my, my, old, my old timers would say he's still wet behind the ears, amen? That's what we'd say, wouldn't it, Brother Ken, amen? Still wet behind the ears, amen, you know? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and how do we help? I mean, it doesn't matter if he's 24 years of age or if he's 50 years of age. How do we help the leader, amen? And how do we help Tim, Brother Pastor Tim Holman when he was here? Here's the way we should have helped him. If we didn't, woe be unto us. We can't undo what, we, what we've already done, but we sure can make sure we learn from the past. Amen. My grandfather also used to say, he's not wise who learns from his own mistakes. He's wise who learns from the mistakes of others. And I don't want to cut my hand off with a chainsaw when I can see somebody else did it. Amen. And so I, I've tried to be wise and look around. That's one of the reasons why I'm an evangelist. One of the reasons why I feel like I have a heartbeat on churches because I watch churches. I evaluate churches. I take time to see what's going on in churches and, and, and to see where the problem is. Leadership can be a problem and fellowship can be a problem. And when we get all those both fixed, you know what happened? We have success. Amen. They got that temple built, didn't they? A beautiful temple because both of them did what they're supposed to do. So love, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, look at verse 12. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sakes and be at peace among yourselves. Know them that labor among you. Get to know them. That, you know, don't, don't, don't let it be where he is a stranger to you. And that, I think that thing, knowing, is to be uh, where, you're, where you're sensitive and, you, you, and you're aware of what he's going through. The Bible talks about remember them that have the rule over you, which means to have them in your mind. You know, when, when, when Pastor Holman was here, I used to think a lot about the hours he was working and about the, the burdens he and I used to say to him, Pastor, I used to counsel him some, and then I used to say, Pastor, I'm sorry I'm not here to help you and do more for you. And Pastor, I, I wish that you would work so many hours and because I, I, knew, I knew what was going on in his life, and I knew the toll that it was going to take, amen? You need to know them, amen? And, 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 then, and then to esteem them very highly in love, in love, respect, respect. It's the office we respect, not the man. But because they're serving the Lord, that gives the man respect because of his office. Amen? And very highly in love. Notice he puts the phrase, in love there. You know, some people respect somebody, but they don't love them. The greatest commandment is to love God. The second, like it, love thy neighbor. And the new commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. And so the greatest thing that we need to do for our preacher is love him. And his wife too, amen? And it's true. We need to love them, love them, love them. You know, I, I know what it's like to be a pastor who somebody doesn't love. I know what it's like when people don't love you. I know what it's like when your family is not loved. Now, I'm not bitter, and I'm not angry, and I'm not trying to cry the blues. I'm just telling you it's just something that happens in the church that should never happen. It should never happen that we don't love the man of God and his family. It should never happen. Never. I'm going to tell you what, there are no perfect preachers. It's like there are no perfect church members. And if you want to start being critical of the pastor, I'm sure we can find something to be critical of you about. Amen? I'm not trying to be mean. The truth of the matter is, is we expect perfection out of everybody else, and we tolerate or excuse imperfection out of ourselves. What we need to do is learn to live in love. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love covereth the multitude 
of sins. Amen? Hey, he may, he may fail, but I still love him. Amen? I had some people mistreat me, but I still love them. Amen? I have had some men who have ruined their, their office, can never be a pastor again, but I still love them. But Dr. Howes used to say, if you say, I used to love him, you never did love him because a friend loveth at all times. Amen? And love never faileth. I may not agree, I may not condone, but I will always love. I, I love Brother Holman. I still love him, love him with all my heart. I miss him. He's a great preacher. I love him. And I will love him. I'll go to my grave loving him and loving Mindy and the girls. Were they perfect? No. Did they have some their problems? Yes. But they had to put up with me, and that made them pretty good people. Amen? Love, 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 love. By the way, love needs to be said and love needs to be shown. Amen? Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? I want to hear you say it. I love you. And then he said, then feed my sheep. Now show it. Amen? Listen, don't just, I mean, don't, don't forget to tell preacher that you love him. Don't forget to show preacher that you love him. Don't forget to do things that illustrate, I love you, preacher. You know, write a note to him. Amen? Notes are wonderful things. Amen? It's a good thing to get a note. It's a bad thing to get a negative note. It's a good thing to get a positive note. Amen? It's a bad thing to hear some bad news before you go in the pulpit. It's a good thing to hear some good news in the pulpit. Can I tell you, don't, don't come in and drop on, uh-uh, I'm mad at you and I'm leaving on a preacher before he goes to preach. Amen. <laughs> You're ruining him, amen. You're ruining his day, amen. Well, that's just love him, love him, love him, love him, love him, amen. And look, I just met him, so I already love him, amen. I mean, just what a lovable couple and what a lovable young uh, baby. And, and let's just love him, all right? Number two. Uh, uh, go to First Chronicles 29 again, and we're going to probably stay around First Chronicles a lot, so you can keep your finger there. First Chronicles 29, and go with me, verse number 24. Now, uh, the work is great; the leader yet young and tender. How do we treat and help the leader? First, we love him. Secondly, in Second Chron- in First Chronicles 29, and verse number 24, look what it says here: and all the princes and the mighty men. And all the sons likewise of King David submitted themselves unto Solomon the king. I'm going to give you the third word, loyalty. The second word, loyalty. 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 Here's what you find in this passage of Scripture. Everybody who was loyal to David immediately became loyal to Solomon. And everybody that didn't become loyal to Solomon ended up getting removed or killed. Amen. Loyalty. And when I pastor, look, I don't, I don't believe that any man is a God. I don't believe that I'm perfect. But I used to say to my staff, I can't abide disloyalty. We should never be disloyal to our church. We should never be disloyal to our preacher. Now, I understand heresy. I understand those things. I'm, I'm not dealing with that, okay, tonight. I'm talking about what you and I can do to help. A pastor needs to know my people are loyal. Yeah, it's like a, a husband, right? I mean, a husband needs to be loyal to his wife, right? A wife needs to be loyal to her husband, right? I mean, I don't want to wake up in the morning and wonder if my wife's going to come home to me or go home to some other man. I want to wake up in the morning and wonder if my wife's on my side or she's on the side of somebody else. Amen. I mean, I, I want my wife, I want, my, I want to know from my wife, and I want my wife to know I'm loyal to you. I am on your side. You can count on me. I will not stab you in the back. I will not, I will not go, 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 go uh, sleep in some other bed with somebody else. I will not make uh, any, any deals with the enemy or the competition. Amen. In America, when you, when you do that, they call that being a traitor. Well, I'm, I'm on the army, but I'm going to go over here and make a deal uh, with the enemy. I'm going to go over here and make a deal with a No, that's traitorism. Uh, be loyal. Be loyal. Be loyal. You know, I, look, I, I guess I was spoiled growing up in the Haven Baptist Church because it's the only church in Haven, Kansas. Therefore, if you're going to go to church, you want to be in the right kind of church, you had to go there whether things went good or went bad. Whether the preacher was happy or whether the preacher got in a fit and screamed and ripped your face off. Amen. And sometimes preachers have bad days. 
And sometimes they get in the flesh and say some things they shouldn't say. But you know what? I didn't have another church to hop to, so I just had to be loyal. And it taught me. I spent, I spent from the time I was nine months before I was born until I went off as a junior in college, I was at the Haven Baptist Church. And my position has always been wherever I go and God puts me, I'm staying there. Now, I'm not saying there's not a time to leave, but I'm just telling you, I'm staying there. And I tell folks, I've always been loyal to my preachers and to my church. And I just tell folks, you know, if you want to call up my pastors and ask them if I was loyal, you call them up. You want to ask them if I caused them trouble, you call them up. I'll give you their phone numbers. So I never figured my job is to go into church and cause trouble or correct anything, to correct the preacher. My job is to go into church and help the preacher get the job done that God's called him to do. Amen? And there was loyalty. Go, keep your finger in 1 Chronicles 29. We go to 2 Samuel chapter 8. I just kind of hate it that so many Christians are for sale to the cheapest bidder or the highest bidder. They think it's the highest bidder. I think it's the cheapest bidder. Amen? You know, I'll run from an independent Baptist church any day to a, to a neo church. Yeah, you're, you're, get, you're going to the cheaper bidder. You think he's a higher bidder, but he's cheapening you. Amen? Yeah, it's like some girl leaving her daddy and, and going out and prostituting herself with some man that doesn't love her. She thinks that's really great. No, really, she stooped. Amen. Look, I love this church. My wife and I, I think I've said it, but I want to say it again. My wife and I love this church. This is our church. We're not looking to go anyplace else, and all we want is for this church to be successful for the Lord. And if it's not, my heart will break, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Honestly, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's the truth. Amen. Amen. 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 15. And David reigned over all Israel, and David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. And Joab the son of Zeruiah was over the host, and Jehoshaphat the son of Ahilad uh, 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 was recorder. And if you can do better on these names, you, you tell me after service, amen. And Zadok the son of Ahitub, <laughs> probably Ahitub, I don't know, Ahitub, that's kind of funny, amen. And, and Ahimelech the son of Abiathar were the priests, and Sariah was the scribe. And watch this next name. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over both the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and David's sons were chief rulers. Now go to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23. It says there in verse 20, chance 23, 20, And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kazbil, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in the time of snow. And he slew an Egyptian, a, good, a goodly man. And the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with a staff and plucked a spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. These things, things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and, and had the name among three mighty men, was more honorable than the thirty but he attained not to the first three. And David set him as over his God. So here we have Benaiah serving David. Now go to 1 Kings chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter 1, very quickly. 1 Kings chapter 1. And look with me at verse number 44. 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse 44. It says, And the king hath sent with him Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and the Cherethites and the Pelethites, they have caused him to ride upon the king's mule. So here's what happened. Uh, God, here's Benaiah. Benaiah, uh, and, and he was a great soldier, and he put him over the Cherethites. And, and, and now Solomon is going to be king because his brother Adonijah has tried to set himself up as king. And the king says, I want my faithful men to take Solomon and put him upon my beast and put my robe upon him and put my crown upon him and go through and say, Blessed be Solomon, the king of Israel. And notice who he selects to do that. One of those men, Benaiah. Go down to uh, 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. And I want you to see something. And now it says in 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 25, And King, who? Solomon. So now David is no longer king. Who's King? Solomon. Now King Solomon sent by the hand of who? Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. I want you to follow, some, follow this. Take and go home and study Benaiah. Benaiah, as far as I can tell, served David. And when David was no longer king, he loyally served Solomon. And when Solomon was no longer king, he served the next kings. And you actually find him serving Hezekiah the king. You know what he taught us? He taught us about lo being loyal. Now listen to me. I am loyal to a preacher, but I'm loyal to a church. Thank God you are too. 
You know, the king can't stay there forever. You know, the pastor can't be around forever. It's just the nature of the church. The church is to go on until Christ comes back. And Pastor Lambert was my pastor, and then he left, and he's dead. And Marvin Valdois was my pastor, and he left. He's not dead yet. And, and, and then, uh, uh, then I was gone, amen? And then Dean Flanner came. And you go through the history of the Haymap Church. In the case of the church I started, I planned it in 1987. I pastored it for 26 years until 2013. And now Pastor Andy is there. And the one thing I preach to my people uh, to prepare them for me leaving is you need to stay loyal to the house of God and the man of God so the work of God can continue. Amen. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. I'm loyal to Amazing Grace Baptist Church. I'm not ashamed to say everybody, I go to Amazing Grace Baptist Church. That's my church. I love it. I'm loyal to it. No, I'm not interested in going to your church. I love you very much. I, I'm an evangelist. Evangelists, they like to get evangelists in their churches. But I'm not changing churches, amen. This is where I'm supposed to be. God led me here, and this is where I'm going to be, amen. Praise the Lord. We need to be loyal, amen. A pastor should never wonder if his people are going to stay with him. He shouldn't hear things or feel like, boy, you know what, uh, they're, 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 they're getting ready to leave me. That should never happen. And by the way, if you ever have an issue with a pastor, if you ever have an issue with a pastor, instead of being one of these people that sneaks out the back door uh, and never says anything or one of these people that stirs up a bunch of strife, be a man and be a lady and go talk to him face to face. Amen. Go talk to him. Just face up to it. Own up. If I would ever leave this place, I would never leave this place without going to my preacher and say, Preacher, I need to talk to you. I got, I need, we need to discuss this, and here's the reason why. And I tell you what, I'm not going to leave here over uh, hurt feelings. I'm not going to leave here over not getting the recognition I think I ought to get. I'm never going to leave here you know, over a pastor taking a stand that he ought to stand, even if it, if it affects me. I'm not going to leave here for that. I won't leave here unless God moves me from here. And I don't expect that to happen. The only thing that would cause that is heresy. Amen? Heresy. Amen? Loyalty. 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 You know, where do you think amazing grace would be today if people had stayed loyal? Jump ship. Head off. You know, when I'm in battle and the battle's getting bad, I don't want my soldiers leaving. Amen? AWOL, treason. We used to shoot them. Amen? Not anymore. People brag on them. Think they're some kind of spiritual giants because they decided to not be loyal. Well, I'm for people who are loyal. Amen? I love America. I'm loyal to my country. Amen? I love America. I love Kansas. That's why I'm back here. Amen? I'm loyal to this state. Amen? People say, who would want to live in Kansas? I do. Who likes the flat plains? I do. Who likes the wind blowing? I do. Who likes the blue sky? I do. Amen. I love it. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. Well, look at the next one. Go to 1 Chronicles 29. First, how, what do we do? The, 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 the work is great and the leader, young and tender. What do we do? Love, love. Number two, loyalty. Number three, lavish, lavish. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 6. Then the chief of the fathers and princes, David said, who will consecrate themselves to the service today? Next verse, verse 6. Then the chief of the fathers and the princes and the tribes of Israel and the captains of the thousands and of the hundreds with the rulers of the king's work offered willingly and gave for the service of the house of God of gold 5,000 talents, 10,000 drams of silver, 10,000 talents of brass, 18,000 talents, and 100,000 talents of iron. And they, which, uh, and, and, and they with whom uh, pre pre precious stones were found gave them to the treasure house of the Lord. I'll tell you, what do we do to help a young man in the ministry? We make sure that we lavish upon the church. Amen? We make sure that we're not stingy in our giving. We make sure that, you know, maybe... We just take, these guys had these treasures. They had them somewhere, right, stored up. Probably had them in their IRA. Had them over there in their storehouse for their retirement. And David got up and said, look, this is what I've done. This is a great work. We need to get it done. And my son is so young and he needs your help. And now what are you going to do? And they heart moved him. And they went over and they got their storehouse. And they brought it down and said, here. Well, hey, it's, uh, it's not that important to me. Look, it's just stuff. 
And, and, and I'd rather give it to the Lord's work and see something great done than, and, and lay it up in store and then go down and play shuffleboard in Florida for six years. Amen. Amen. We ought to be lavishing. You know, listen, uh, I tell you four things killing the church, division, dereliction, desertion, and dollars. And by God's grace and helping us, we ought to get to the place where we don't have that problem and that we are lavishing. Well, let me give you the fourth word very quickly. A long-suffering. 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 Christians are to be characterized by patience with each other. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, and faith, temperance. The Bible tells us that we are to be long-suffering one with another. Long-suffering. Look, yeah, you're going to have to be patient. Got to be patient with preachers. Just have to be patient with them, just like preachers have to be patient with you. When I was a preacher, listen, I thought all my people ought to do exactly like the Bible said. I thought all of them be out here doing exactly, this is what we need to do, blah, 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 blah. And it didn't happen. So what I had to do, be patient with them. Because if I wasn't patient with them, you know what happens? You hurt them. You've got to be patient with preachers too. You've got to give preachers time to grow. You've got to give preachers time to lead. You've got to give preachers time to, to, to pray and seek wisdom. Can I tell you, everything that you think can be made in a snap judgment cannot always be made with a snap judgment when you're the leader. When you follow, you say, well, that's what we ought to do. Yeah, well, let me make you the leader. See if you think that's what we ought to do. Amen. It's a whole different story when you're the one going to be accountable and when you realize that your decision can make or break and this decision can either be what God wants or what God doesn't want and you're going to be responsible. So you've got to be patient. Amen? Patient. Patient. I, I, I believe this. I, I, I think I heard this said and I believe I watched a few of Brother Haley's messages before and he's already growing. He's growing. Can you imagine what he's going to be when he's preaching this pulpit three and four times a week? I'm telling you, it's exciting to me. What's going to happen? When you begin to see a young man that begins to blossom, you get to see a guy like me. I'm getting old. I'm probably going backwards. But you get to see somebody going forwards, amen? And what about you? But you've got to be patient. And, you know, I look back on some of the sermons I preach, and I preach some really duds. Can I tell you, I said some really dumb and non-biblical things. Can I tell you, I really made some stupids that really uh, hurt some people. And I'm glad I had a group of people that were patient with me. And said, well, you know, preacher's just a human, and preacher sometimes makes mistakes, and I don't know what preacher's going through. Yeah, they lost a, pair, a couple in miscarriage. Did you know that? Pretty tough. I mean, you know, as a preacher, you don't usually tell your burdens to your people because you're supposed to be a burden bearer. But we need to be long-suffering, long-suffering. Give time. Listen to me. Everybody in here is stage. Here's what, I had this happen to me. You know, Dirana, I was preaching, man, I was preaching, boy, I was preaching uh, so strong. Uh, what what a, a, a Christian has been saved for 40 years should be doing. And one day, I was reading in the Bible where Paul said, I fed you with milk and not with meat. And the Holy Ghost said to me, Paul knew when they couldn't handle the meat and they needed milk. He said, you're choking those people. You know what I had to do? I started asking myself, dear God, are my people ready for this yet? I had to learn patience. You see, my, my, my belief, my belief, you want to hear my belief? Everybody ought to go soul winning. My belief. And when I was young, if you don't go soul winning, you're not right with God. That was my belief. That was just my belief. Then Dr. Hatch came one day, he said to me, Brother Houston, I'll help you if you let me. I said, okay, Brother Hatch. He said, you got some good folks in this church will never win anybody to Christ. I looked at him and said, I, it's not, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just telling you it's true, but they're good folks. And if you'll love them and be patient with them, you'll see them grow. You know what I had to do? I had to learn to be patient. You know what I think? As soon as you get saved, you ought to be out there soul winning already. As soon as you get saved, you, know I mean? you ought to get away all your sin. I mean, that's just my, that's my zeal. Amen? 
But my zeal must be backed up with love and patience. Amen? And when you deal the opposite way, when you're dealing with a pastor as a first pastor, and mine was a first pastor. By the way, mine was a first pastor, and I didn't go to Bible college, and I never had a church class. You're talking about starting out on the wrong foot. You're talking about the blind leading the blind, man. I was a blind man leading the blind. You talk about making dumb mistakes because you're doing everything by, uh, by, by, you know, by, by uh, what's that school of hard knocks? You're learning as you go. You talk about making a bunch of mistakes. Thank God I had some people there who were long suffering me. Preacher, we love you. Preacher, you know, uh, I know <laughs> you're having a tough time, but we're just going to give you time. Amen. Well, let me give you the next one very quickly. Lifting. Look at 1 Chronicles 29, verse 19. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 19. First of all, we need to lift up the man of God in prayer. Verse 19, and give unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart to keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, and thy statutes. David is praying for the man of God. The greatest thing we can do is lift up the man of God in prayer. Lift him up. Oh, God, help, Pastor. Help, Pastor. Oh, God, give him wisdom and understanding. God, show him how to direct us. And then number two, we lift up the man of God physically. Go to Exodus chapter 17 very quickly. Keep your fingers in Chronicles. Exodus chapter 17. Now listen, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. I feel like you already know this. I understand this. Don't think I'm, I think you're bad. I think you're good. I think you all understand all this stuff. I just want to reiterate that what we need to do is just hold to these things and make sure that we just kind of have this list before us and say, look, yep, that's where we need to do as we head forward in this, uh, in this uh, ministry. And I believe that is going to involve Pastor Haley. And if it doesn't involve Pastor Haley, then it goes for the next pastor too. Amen? Whoever that would be. Amen. But look at it in verse number, Exodus chapter 17, verse 9. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out and fight with the Malachite. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill from the rod, with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, uh, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and he took a stone and put it under him. And he sat there on an Aaron, and her stayed up his hands. And the one on the one side, the one on the other side, and, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. We need to lift up the man of God in prayer. We need to lift up the man of God in physically. I mean, listen, when you see the man of God is weary and tired, you need to do something to help. And this looks like, God bless you, preacher. Preacher, what can I do? Man, you're overloaded. Looks like you're about to fold. You know what? Can I tell you this about preachers? Preachers will not, try to, will not, will not admit to weakness. Most leaders will not admit to weakness. Most leaders will literally kill themselves off to get the job done instead of looking for somebody to help. Man, we need to help physically. Preacher, man, look, man, let me help you with that. We build a church building, seven acres. We build a 13,000 square, 13,800 square foot facility in 2000. I worked six days a week, 12 and 16 hours a day. We got the building done in four months. Most of the time, it was me and three teenage boys who wanted to play more than they wanted to work. Can I tell you, we were putting some drywall up in the auditorium, about 15 feet up in the air, 12-foot sheets, sliding them up there on scaffolding, and, uh, and, and one of them fell to the floor, and I said, I'm done, I'm quitting. I mean, I broke, I came to my breaking point. I've been working here. And I see my family. I got a cell phone. First cell phone I got, I got that so my wife could get in touch with me in case there was a problem because she couldn't even get in touch with me. I remember my daughter and Joanna and I, one night, a Wednesday night after church over in the auditorium with a spotlight up, we're hanging drywall up on the, up on the platform trying to get it done. And a guy who uh, used to come to our church and, and didn't come to our church, went to another church, came in. He said, what are you doing, preacher? I said, putting up some drywall. He said, this time of night, so we've got to get it done. He said, let me help you. When I got done building that building, you understand, I, I, it, 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 it took me four months to relax. It took me a year before I felt like I could pastor again. Because I was no longer focusing on pastoring, I was focused on building a building. 
boy, been nice. <laughs> there have been some people who say, Preacher, you go home, study. Let's take care of this. Preacher, you need to be over there. You don't need to be out here doing this. I know what God wants to do. I'm going to do my part. Amen. And I'm not trying to be me. I'm trying to help you see. Lift him up physically. If something's going on, you see he's tired and weary. Say, look, preacher. Hey, preacher, I think you need to take your wife and go on a little break. In fact, here's some money, preacher. And I want you to take your wife and I want you to take her out to eat. And preacher, I know you're not making a lot of money, but you and your wife deserve a little time away and, and I'll watch the baby and you go. Amen. Amen. And then lift up the man of God provisionally. Look at 1 Kings chapter 4 very quickly. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 22. Again, I'm preaching to the choir. I know you don't need this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to leave in town Saturday anyway. Amen. <laughs> uh, 1 Kings 4, 22. And Solomon's provision for one day. Look at this. And Solomon's provision for one day was 30 measures of fine flour. And three score measures of meal, ten fat oxen, twenty oxen out of the pastures, and a hundred sheep beside hearts and roebucks and fallow deer and fatted fowl. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, listen, when I say these things, I'm, I'm just sharing my heart and I'm explaining things that happened to me. None of these things mean that I'm bitter. I, I never have been bitter about anything that happened in the ministry. But they do, they do illustrate what goes on and people don't pay attention to it. There was a time when my family survived on tortillas and salmon. The salmon was what came in the agricultural packages. You know, people got those USDA government packages. They had cheese and milk and beans and all kinds of stuff. And they had canned salmon. And you know what? The people didn't like the salmon, Brother Ken. So they bring the salmon to the preacher. Well, that's fine. I'm glad they considered taking care of me. But I often wonder, why didn't they bring some cheese over? Why didn't they bring some milk over? No, what I don't want, I'm going to take to the preacher. It's kind of like what we do, God. My leftovers you can have. I'm going to buy a new van. You can have the old beat up one, God. And I got about $600 worth of work to be done on it, but I, surely the church can use it. No, the church don't need any more of that junk. We don't need any more debts, amen. We don't need that stuff. Keep it. We just hauled out three dumps or two dumpsters loaded stuff now. We don't bring any more in. Amen. Amen. Keep it. Throw it away. Take it on a yard sale. Amen. Take it to Goodwill. Let somebody have it. Amen. Well, look, and so, you know, this the way it was. And uh, my wife to this day, when you mention salmon, she's about, you know, because we've had it every way you could have it. Salmon, mac and cheese, salmon patties. I don't know. We may have tried salmon spaghetti. I don't know what we did. Amen. I was just glad to have food to eat. Amen. But take care of them. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says, Who goeth a warfare at any time of his own charge? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say these things as a man, or saith the law the same also. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care of oxen for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be taker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? You know, a pastor needs to have hope that he's going to be taken care of. It's a very sad situation when you feel like that there's no hope that you're going to have your needs met. Amen? And so our church needs to get to that place. And then number six, very quickly, laboring. Laboring. Put that word down. Laboring. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 2. 2 Chronicles chapter 2. Laboring. Remember what David said to Solomon? You've been chosen to be king. You've been chosen to build this temple for God. It is a great work, and you're young and tender. He said, but get out there and do it. And then he said to the people, you need to help him. You need to consecrate yourself to the service. And look at 2 Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 1. And Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord and a house for his kingdom. And Solomon to told out three score and ten thousand men to bear burdens and four score thousand to hew in the mountain and three thousand and six hundred to oversee them. Wow, wouldn't you like to have a workforce like that? 
Amen? If you look down in verse 17, it said, And Solomon numbered all the strangers that were in the land of Israel after the numbering where with David his father had numbered them. And they were found in 150,000, 3,000, and 600. And he set three score and 10,000 of them to be bearers of burden and four score thousand to be hewers in the mountains and 3,000 and 600 overseers instead of the people. And then Second Chronicles chapter 3, if you take time to go home and read it, you'll see the temple being built. And, uh, and, and there's a, a man sent by Hiram to be the leader. And the people are working. And you know what the Bible says in, 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 in chapter, uh, number, uh, chapter number 3? You know what it says? It attributes to Solomon that he built the temple. But it wasn't Solomon who built it. It was Solomon who appointed people to get the job done. But God said Solomon built You see, that's God's plan. God gives a plan, gives a plan. God gives a man to oversee it, and then all people work together. And then God says, look, Solomon built it, and Hiram built it, and these people worked, and they labored, and we got the job done. So we need to labor, okay? Labor, 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 labor. And I just want to try to help you. The thing we need to labor in most in this church is we need to labor in building it by getting people attending. Amen. Soul winning, inviting people to church. Bring somebody. Amen. I go all over the country, and I challenge pastors to have friend days. Friend day. Have a friend day. Have a friend day. Everybody bring a friend. If everybody brought a friend next week, we'd double our attendance. You know, I used to say, if you don't have a friend, go down to the drunk on the street and offer him 10 bucks to come to church with you. You say, well, I don't believe in that stuff. Well, I'm just joking. But the truth of the matter is, is how hard are we trying to get people in church? How hard are we trying? You know what I found? I found if you try hard enough, you usually succeed. The truth is, matter, we're not trying. I'm, I'm guilty. I'm not trying like I should, man. I should, I should be going out. I should be bringing somebody every Sunday to the house of God. And I need to labor more, labor more, labor more, labor more. And God keeps with me. And then lastly, number seven, look at 1 Chronicles 17, 15. I'll give you the last word and we'll go to the house. Seven is the number of perfection, so I gave you a perfect way to help the young man. <laughs> What's the last one, Brother Houston? Longevity. Longevity. Look at 1 Corinthians 17, 15. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Here we have Nathan the prophet with David. Now go to 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 29. 2 Chronicles 9, verse 29. Now the rest of the Acts of Psalms. Are you there? Say amen. I still hear the pages turning. Let me wait. Amen. All right. 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 29. Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the book of who? Nathan the prophet. So we have Nathan the prophet David. Now we have Nathan the prophet with Solomon. Now go to 2 Chronicles chapter 9 and verse 29, if you would, please. No, I just did that one. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. No. All right, I, I'm sorry, I didn't put that verse down. But if you check it out, you'll find that Nathan the prophet is also writing about things under Hezekiah. What am I talking about? Longevity, longevity, longevity. Yeah, let me say this. Um, my dad's, since he was a senior in high school or junior in high school, has never been in any other church in his life except Haven Baptist Church. Look, Ken, how long you been here? Amen. Longevity. I appreciate that, Brother Ken. Longevity. Appreciate that. It used to be that way in America. And, and no, I know big cities a little different. I didn't grow up in a big city, but I love going to these little country churches. I was in a church in Lakin. And there's dad and mom and their daughter and her family and their daughter and her family. And I go all over these towns in America where they don't have this church hopping opportunity. Where they're in that church all their life. And their grandparents, my grandparents were Haven Baptist Church and died there. My mom and dad have been in that church and are going to die there. Amen? And, and, and I would be in that church if I lived over there, but I'm not over there. Well, as long as they don't go to heresy, so probably wouldn't be. <laughs> But I, I believe in longevity. And by the way, I believe in longevity of pastors. You see, 
I was 26 years at the same church. I would still be there today pastoring those people if I didn't know God called me to evangelism. I had no intentions of just saying, I'm here for a year or two, get a little experience, and I'm going someplace else. I don't believe in that stuff. And I believe that you and I ought to get in the church and we ought to say, look, this is my church, and I'm just going to be here, and I'm going to be faithful, and 10 years from now you're going to find me here, and I'm going to be supporting the man of God, and if that's another man of God, I'm going to be supporting him, and we're going to get this job done. Amen and amen. Well, David said, the work is great. and My son Solomon is a youth and tender, and tonight, what do we do? I gave you those things. And I know you'll do them. You already are. You good folks. Preach to the choir. But I felt I needed to do that. So we could get focused. You know, Brother Haley preached about Moses dying in Joshua. Amen? And really, I think that's where we're at. We're that place where the change of the guard, the change of the leadership. And what is Joshua supposed to do? Go get it. What is Solomon supposed to do? Go get it, preacher. What are we supposed to do? Consecrate ourselves to the service of the Lord. Father, we love you.